Well, I want to talk to you tonight about <clears throat> life-changing belief. I want to talk to you about Thomas. I want to read this, this passage here in John. And Holy Spirit, I pray now that you would speak to us. God, that your word would come alive, that our ears would be open, that our hearts would be stirred. God, that you give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Lord, and that you would open the eyes of our understanding, God, that we would see you clearly and that we would experience your glory tonight, God. In Jesus' name, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. John 20, 24. It says, now Thomas, called the twin, or in the King James, Didymus, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see the hands, his hand, in his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. What a statement. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. (laughs) If I were Jesus, I would have said, boo. (laughs) And he said to Thomas, (laughs) man, can you imagine this? Picture this, you guys. Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, And that believing you may have life in his name. Wow. I just love this passage of scripture. Every time I read it, I try to picture myself there in the room with them. Can you you picture yourself there? In a room with the disciples and all of a sudden Jesus materializes in front of you. Peace be to you. He knows what to say. Gosh, I cannot imagine Yet I want to. As as this passage unfolds, John says, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And listen, and that believing you may have life in his name. Like I said, I want to talk about life-changing belief. Life-changing belief, as opposed to belief that doesn't change your life. I don't know if... We're the only society, I, I wouldn't suspect it. But there's, there are beliefs out there that you can believe that really don't affect your life. They really don't change anything. You just believe them. And I'm afraid to say they're very prevalent even in the body of Christ. So, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in the resurrection. But it has no power to change your life. It has no weight to it. It's like your belief in anything else what does it do that affects your life and I want to talk about life changing belief John said the purpose of him writing his gospel at the end there in verse 31 he said I've written these things that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ I've accounted these things I've recorded these things I've written these things that that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of God and that believing you may have life in his name See, Christianity, point number one tonight, is Christianity is not a religion that you ascribe to or that you sign up for or that you put down on your birth certificate that I'm a Christian. It's not that. Christianity is a good news message that you believe in. It's a message you believe. It's a relationship you you have and it's a message that was declared to you that you say, I believe that. I believe that. That's what it is. Let me just read to you what I wrote the gospel is. The gospel is the truth that God came in the person of Jesus Christ and rescued us, 
his children from sin and death. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and he modeled how every man could live in it. He took away our sin. He took away the whole sin of the world when he gave his body to be nailed to the cross. Three days later, he rose again from the dead, proving that he was God and proving that he had the power over death, hell, and the grave. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and sent back the Holy Spirit to live in us, making us new creatures in Christ. He called us his body. That, listen, if we would believe, if we would believe, we'd be children of God, empowered by his life to fulfill his purpose. If you believe that, it'll change your life. But it's got to be a belief that is not just in your head or a mental ascent, but it's a life-changing belief where Thomas said, Lord, I'm not going to believe unless... Thomas said, well, I'm going to get into it. I'll get into it here in a second. But the belief that we have to have has got to do something and it's got to be more than just a mental ascent. Yeah, two plus two is four, I believe that. No, it's got to be... Jesus came, paid the price, all this stuff. If I believe this, John said, if you believe this, I've written these things that you would believe, and if you believe it, you'll have life in his name. You'll have life in his name. Does your belief generate life in your life? Does it change your life? Romans 1.16 says, Paul said, for I, am, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also the Greek. This salvation that says is available to everyone who believes is the word sozo. It means a bunch of things. It doesn't just mean a ticket to heaven. It means saved, healed, delivered, set free, made whole, kept safe. Salvation is made available by the power of God to everyone who believes. Does your belief save you? Does your belief cause God to to, to deliver you and heal you and redeem you. Where is your belief at? The power of God to sozo your life is available if you would believe. This word, this word life in the scripture that in believing we would have life in his name is this word zoe, zoe, life. It's the God kind of life. It's not the life that you have blood plumping through your veins and a heart beating life. It's your spirit coming alive and being very aware that God is my father, I'm his child, and he's empowered me with his life. And now I have the healing, the deliverance, the salvation, and everything he has for me, I have that inside of me. And I can walk with my head held high knowing that his life is in me to accomplish his purposes. That's the life and so much more that I could even describe that God wants to give us, the Zoe life. John 1, 4 said this about Jesus. He said, talking about Jesus, talking about the word who became flesh, in him, in Jesus, was life. That word is Zoe. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That Zoe life gave men understanding for why they were here. When you see light, what does light do? But it, it, it shows you, it illuminates. It, it, you know, if you turn all the lights off, you could get hurt running around in here. But light shows you what's going on in here and it gives you the ability to navigate through this room and get to where you're going without tripping over stuff. So when the Bible says the world was in darkness, everyone was tripping over themselves destroying themselves, not knowing, and the world is still in darkness if they don't have the light of life that was made possible through Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ, who is the life, comes into our life, the lights turn on in our spirit and we go, whoa, I know why I'm alive now. I know why I'm alive. That's the kind of life I'm talking about. And John said, if you would believe, you would have that kind of life happen in your life. So, Jesus' purpose 
in coming, you guys, was not necessarily to get us to heaven. It was to get his life back inside of us that had been lost through sin, that had been lost through Adam and Eve. And he came to restore that which was lost. John, 1, John 20, 21, I'm going to just read this again. But these things are written, John said, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I just want to drill that into us tonight. That life is made possible through our belief. And somebody would say, well, what about, what about repentance? Don't we need to repent? Belief and repentance work simultaneously at the same time. Because what does repentance mean? Repentance means change the way you think. Repent, change the way you think. And what is belief? But a way you think. In a way, if you repent, if you believe, you're, you are repenting. But some people would say, well, is that all it takes to be, to be saved and to experience the sozo of God just to believe? Yeah, if you just believe, in believing, you are turning your back on everything you used to believe and you are believing in Jesus Christ. You are repenting. Mark 1.15, Jesus actually put them together and I'll show you this. That he, Jesus said when he came, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe, they go together. When you believe, you're actually repenting and life is coming into your life when you change your mind and start believing. Paul said this in Acts 19.4. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized, um, sorry, not Paul. Yeah, then Paul said, yeah, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people, they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So Paul telling these brand new believers, um, recounting what, what John the Baptist was doing. John the Baptist was in the wilderness preaching repentance, right? Indeed, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe. So he's telling them, believe, and in the same word, he's saying, repent. You cannot believe without repentance, and you cannot repent without believing, they go hand in hand. If somebody says, well, you need to repent first and then believe. Well, technicality, but God wants us to believe. And if we would believe and put our faith in him, repentance would naturally be, be a byproduct. Amen. I remember I used to be focused on repentance being I need to change everything I'm doing. I need to clean up myself. I thought that's what repentance was. I need to take a spiritual shower before I come to God. You know, I need to beat myself up a little bit so that I prove to God that I'm you know, really serious, and I need to weep at the altar and make sure I have at least a, a pint of snot in order to, you know, validate my repentance. Don't think about that. <laughs> but, you know, that's not repentance. Repentance, it can be, it can be a fruit of repentance, but repentance takes place in your mind when you're like, whoa, the light came on, I see things differently. I choose to believe in Jesus Christ. I choose to believe. And all there goes all my doubts. There goes all my fears. There goes everything. When Christ comes in, everything changes. Everything changes. You can't believe, you guys, without having your life change. Biblically. I know in America we can. But in Scripture, when you believe something, it changes your life. Unfortunately, I've met people that say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and they have no life change. Nothing has gone on. They go to, Easter, they go to church on Easter and Christmas on various days, but it does not affect their life. Yeah, I believe just like everybody else believes. I think the latest statistic I read is 84% of Americans say they believe in Jesus Christ, the Christians. They have a belief that has not changed their life. It's not a biblical belief. It's a life, it's a, it's a belief that has no life attached to it. It's actually a demonic belief. James 1, James 2.19 says this, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. You see, there is a, there is a saving faith, 
that activates the healing, the power, the sozo, the set free and deliverance in your life. There's a saving faith and there's a demonic faith that just says, I believe. But you know what? I've said this before. Some of the demons even move more than some people with their faith. Scripture says, you believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. Some people believe though and don't even tremble. So acknowledgement of God's existence and knowing God, knowing the gospel story is not equivalent to faith that produces transformation. Salvation is not a ticket to heaven. Salvation is heaven and coming inside of us and him, Jesus Christ, taking up his resurrection life inside of us. There's a story of Zacchaeus. You remember the story of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, Jesus saw him in the you know, top of a sycamore fig tree. He was gonna look and see if he could see Jesus coming through Jericho. And Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. And, Jesus, and Zach, Zacchaeus made haste, came down, and Jesus came into his house. And Luke 19, 8 says this, then Zacharias, after Jesus had been in his house for a while, Zacharias, or I'm not saying Zacharias, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Look how his life changed. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation, sozo, has come to this house because he has he has all he because he also is a son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost what was lost the life of god that was originally placed in human beings had been lost and jesus christ came to put his life back inside of us that's why he came not to get us to heaven, but so that he could deposit heaven inside of us and so that we can manifest his glory here on the earth. If you were, if you were saved just to go to heaven, then why didn't you die the moment you say, said the sinner's prayer? I mean, after all, that's the purpose, right? Just say this prayer and your name's written in the book of life and just hold on until the end comes. God has so much more planned for you than that. And I'm sorry if you believe that that, I can't even call it a gospel. If you believe that, heaven is, 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 heaven becomes a part of you when you believe. And John said, I want to stir up your belief. I've written these things so that you would believe and in believing you would have life in his name. And faith always works itself out. Let me just James 2.19, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Genuine belief will always, will always have a life change attached to it. And so Thomas, Thomas here in this scripture, in John 20, Thomas said, unless I see him and touch him for myself, I will not believe. When I was reading that this week, I thought, man, some people are just oh, tough crowd, you know, just hard. And I started praying about it and thinking about it and like mulling it over in my mind and meditating on it. God, what was it that, that uh, caused Thomas to not believe with the other disciples? I thought, you know, I kind of grew up thinking, I don't know why, but I kind of grew up thinking that Thomas was just kind of a doubter. It was just kind of part of his personality. And, and he's just, you know, in my mind, labeled as Thomas the doubter. And no matter what, he's just going to be a doubter. And you tell him something that's true, and he's going to doubt it first. I just kind of thought that way about Thomas. I don't know, probably because of this story. And so I, I had to wrestle with that. I'm like, is he just a, just a doubter? Is that just kind of who he is, God, or what? And I was thinking about it, and I was thinking about it. And I read some scriptures, and I... And I found out that Thomas was actually a pretty extreme disciple. Thomas was not just like, I don't know, in my mind I had this like stick drawing of like the wimpy kid and there's Thomas, you know. And he's just kind of like hanging on by the skin of his teeth. And thankfully Jesus came and met, met him personally or else he would have fallen away. You know, just kind of a weak individual is kind of like how I pictured him. 
And uh, he's not at all that. He's not at all that. When you study out Thomas, Thomas actually went to the, uh, you know, to the country of India and preached the gospel, became a martyr, and he was a phenomenal apostle and a man of God. But even, in, even while he was walking with Jesus, I came across this scripture, and I want to read it to you. It's, I want to read it out of context. I want to read it in context. And it's in John 11. It's when um, messengers were sent to Jesus and, uh, uh, for, because Lazarus, his friend, had died. And they went and told Jesus that Lazarus, your friend, your friend has died. In John 11, verse 6, to get the whole context, it says, So when he had heard that he was sick, Jesus stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Listen to this, this is key. Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. I love how Jesus' disciples didn't know what was going on. (laughs) Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, guys. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go. And then there's this little scripture that baffled me for a long time. Then Thomas said, who is called the twin, or Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. For a long time I read that and I thought, man, what a downer, Thomas. You know, are you talking about Lazarus? Are you talking about wanting to go die with Lazarus? Is that what you're talking about? But he's not. Remember back back up in verse uh, eight, the disciples said to him, but Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you and you're gonna go to Judea again? You see, Jesus is going right into the middle of a death trap, you know? He's gonna endanger himself. And Thomas, he's not saying, for a long time I read this, I just read this scripture way too fast and I thought Thomas was saying, my my life is miserable, I'm a doubt in Thomas, I should just die. (laughs) That's what I thought he was saying. But verse 16 says, Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Guys, if Jesus is going there, let's go with him. If he's going to die, let's go with him. Let's die with him. This is an intense disciple. He's saying, I've counted the cost. And no matter where Jesus goes, I'm going with him. Thomas was not a pushover. Thomas was not a wimpy kid. Thomas was not hanging on by a thread. He is not just a doubting Thomas like we kind of visualize. He was intense. Jesus, if you're going to, if you're going to go back into Judea, we're going with you. And if you die, we're dying with you. I mean, he's just as intense as Peter. So he, was, he wasn't, I mean, he, he, he's an awesome, awesome guy. He was ready to die. And so what this is telling me, I'm still asking, God, why is Thomas doubting when when his friends, his disciples, they said, he's risen, he's alive. He says, unless I see with my eyes the nail print and put my hand in those prints and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. What is causing him to be so staunch in his unbelief? You see, what I felt like the Lord put on my heart was Thomas knew the life-changing power of belief and if I believe if I believe that is going to change everything in my life am I ready to believe this will change everything if I believe if I believe that a man is God I will be disowned from my community I will be shunned from the synagogues I will be called a blasphemer and worthy of death am I sure that I, that I want to believe the secondhand information? Am I sure that I want to believe my fellow disciples that he's risen? You see, I don't think it was that, that Thomas just you know, was a hard guy to get converted. I don't think that's the case. I think he understand, understood the power of belief. He understood the power of belief more than 
more than Western Christianity does, where it's just a mental ascent. Thomas understood, man, if I believe, this is going to change everything. This means my life, I, I believe he was a fisherman, everything is going to Everything is going to change. My entire life is going to change. I better find out for myself. Unless I see the nail prints and put my finger where they're at, and unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. I cannot put that much on the line if I don't know personally and experience the risen Jesus Christ. If I don't personally experience it, I can't believe because my belief means that my entire life will change. I don't know if we think that when we pray a sinner's prayer. And we say, man, do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? You see, all of us could go around here and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. I mean, it's very common in church to believe that. (laughs) It's very common in, in, in America to believe that. Because you don't get shunned from society. You're still welcome in, the, in, in, in church and you're still welcome in your family and you're still welcome in different places. Your belief in Jesus Christ does not cost you that much where we are right here, right now. But for Thomas, it meant everything. It meant everything. It was a weighty thing. And so I wanna ask us tonight, do we treat our belief in Jesus Christ as the risen son of God with that much gravity that if I believe this, everything changes? You see, Thomas said, basically, I can't take anyone else's else's word for it. I must find out myself. If I'm going to get this involved and actually put my belief in Christ, I better find out for myself. I better have a personal encounter with this risen Jesus. You see, that's what it meant to be a Christian back in the day, is that in, in, in the, when the Bible was written here, that if you believed in Jesus, you were claiming that a man that had come, lived a life, died on the cross, and many people saw him, that you claimed that man was God. And you're in a very religious society if you're a Jew, and you are gonna face extreme persecution for that. That's what it meant to believe. Later on, as the epistles are being written, especially Romans, you had an emperor by the name of Nero that the emperor claimed divinity. The emperor was God. He was a god. And Romans 10, 9, and 10, which is part of the Romans road that says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That sounds so simple in our society because that's easy. Jesus is Lord. God raised him from the dead. Boom, saved. In that time, you are saying, put a bullseye on my back because I just defied the emperor and called him a liar, and Jesus is Lord, and the emperor is not Lord, he's Lord. Are you getting the gravity of what I'm talking about? This is, this is the belief that Thomas is like, I don't know if I can believe that unless I have a personal encounter with him. I had to wrestle in my own self this week and be like, man, God, let my belief be that strong. Let my belief be, I'm ready to deny every other Lord that would possibly present itself in my life. When you say, when you call me to do something, I will obey you above everything else. Doesn't matter. I've lost my life so that, so that you could have mine and so that you could live inside of me. How much, does your, how much weight does your belief have? Thomas, he couldn't rest on his past experiences. Think about Thomas, what he experienced with Jesus. He saw Jesus heal the sick. He saw him cleanse lepers, open the eyes of the blind, rebuke demons, calm the storm, walk on water, multiply fish and loaves, raise the dead, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If everything that Jesus did would have been written in the Gospel of John, John said, I suppose even the world itself could not contain the books that were written. And Thomas said, I can't even put my current faith, 
I can't even base my current faith on what my experience has been. I need an experience right now with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. That's how weighty it is. You would think that this miraculous experience with Jesus would have been enough for him to believe on that day when his disciple, when the other disciples said, hey, Jesus is risen from the dead, but it wasn't. Any experience, listen to me, any experience short of encountering the risen Christ in a personal way will not transform your life. We have to have an encounter with his Holy Spirit, with his person in such a personal way that it transforms our lives. Has to happen. Now, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he will not bodily come back until the trumpet blows and until he descends and he comes in his second coming. But Jesus said, let me, let me read this to you in John 14, 28. This is what Jesus said. He said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments, listen to this, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I will show up in your life. I will give you an experience to where you don't have to go off of so-and-so's word. You don't have to base your relationship with me off of what the preacher said. I will come to you. I will show you. I will reveal myself to you. You love me? Do what I'm asking you to do. Keep my commands. Keep my word. I will manifest myself to you. You see, because nobody will, you only know God because God has revealed himself to you. It's the only way we can even know God is that he reveals himself to us. Just like the only way you can be born again is if God by his grace walks by, (laughs) graces you and causes you to come alive out of a dead spiritual state. Dead man can't see God. God has to come and wake us up and he is more than willing to do that. But I wanna encourage you, your life and your belief and the faith that you have and the weight of that belief determines how much of the life of God you see in your life. If your belief, if your, if your belief is on a, on, a, on a scale of one to 10 and it's at a one and it's, you know, I believe, but it's, it really hasn't changed my life much, then you probably will not experience the life of God that much in your life because your belief is based on a pretty shallow understanding. But the more you believe, the more you trust in him, when I say things like God has paid the price for your healing, do you believe that? If you believe that, it will manifest itself in your life. God has paid the price for our forgiveness of our sins. Do you believe that? That's something kind of immaterial. I think we have a hard time believing the things that we see with our eyes. And God said, don't walk by sight, but walk by faith. Our belief in the word of God can either hinder or cause to manifest the things that are truly ours in his life and in his word. Our belief So how much weight does your belief have? How much weight does your belief have? In John 20, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, because you have seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I'd have to put myself in that category and you in that category. You're blessed if you believe and you've, and you've never seen Jesus Christ face to face. That'd be most of us, I'd say. <laughs> they said, blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. So 
So it's as simple as that. Thomas was not just a doubter. He was counting the cost and saying, oh man, if I believe this changes where I work, this changes how I talk, this changes how I walk, this changes how I spend my time, this changes what my purpose in life is, this changes um, who, this changes whether or not I, I care about being accepted by men or being rejected. This, this changes everything about my life. Unless I have a personal encounter with him, I'm not willing to do that. And Jesus said, I will come and meet you. And I will prove to you that everything you have in life and everything that you believe currently and everything that is trying to rival the life that I'm giving you is nothing. I'll show you. I'm alive. I'm real. Put your hand here. Put your hand here. Touch me. See that I'm alive. And, G- and Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Any Jewish believer would say, or I would say any Jewish person that did not believe in Jesus at that point, he is disowning everything of his past and saying, Jesus, my Lord and my God, you are it. You are everything. And his belief drove him to be the disciple and the apostle that, that he became in preaching the gospel and seeing miracles, signs, and wonders and not accounting his own life as even anything to... Uh, to hold value in, but he gave his life. He gave his life for, for, for God, for Christ. It's amazing. I don't know if we believe that heavy, but I want us to. I want to. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I want to see more things happen. I want to see, you know, this is cool. We prayed for, um, uh, we pray for people all the time, but, uh, you know, somebody texted me and said, hey, after you prayed for me, uh, I don't understand diabetes totally, but they said my points went down like two points after you believed and commanded diabetes to come out. I'm like, awesome, that's good. I want it completely gone. I want my belief to continue. I want, you know, I mean, I pray for, uh, <laughs> you know, I pray for my dad here. And, and you get better and for, for, uh, for times and seasons and then it comes back, I'm like, man, I want to believe more, God. I want to believe more so that my experience, Jesus, would be the experience you had. And listen, I want us not to be, not to feel guilty or condemned that our belief isn't there where Jesus is at yet. I want us to say, man, if it's possible, I want to go further into this thing with God. I want to believe more. I want to go after what's possible. I want to see these things happen. I want to, I want to see the dead raised and the lame walk and, and toes grow back from amputees and things like this for the glory of God, that God would be glorified and that people would see that Jesus is alive. I want to, I want to be there. And I believe I see it little by little by little, but I'm like, man, I, Lord, I want to believe more. I want to, I want, John, you said I've written these things. You've written the book of John, John, so that I might believe. And that in believing, I would have Zoe life in his name. I would have the God life in his name. I want that. I hope you do too. I hope you do too. I just want to close with one scripture and I just want to um, spend some time here. Um, Letting God minister to us. Romans 8, 11 says this, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life, Zoe, to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The same power that rose Christ from the grave lives in you. Do you believe that? Change the way you, it changes the way you pray. It changes the way you walk. It changes the way you do life. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if, if the spirit, of the dead, spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal. That's the part of you that eventually dies. Not your immortal body, but your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. Jesus is wanting to live his life through you. 
if you'd believe it. I don't know, Abe, that sounds unbelievable. Well, then I pray right now tonight that you would experience the risen Lord Jesus Christ, that he would touch you, that he would come to you. He said, if you love me, I'll manifest myself to you. You keep my commands, you love me, I'll manifest myself to you, I'll come to you. I won't leave you an orphan, I will come to you. What I want to do tonight is I want, I want us to ask him to come and, and visit us. I want to have him, I believe we need to have encounters with the risen Christ through his word, through him showing us that he's alive in our own lives, through answered prayer, through things to where it's undeniable to us. And I believe God knows what each of us needs I believe God knew that Thomas needed that. He knows what you need that is just going to completely rock your world and show you that I'm alive. I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is for me. I don't even know what it is for me exactly. But I want him. I want to know him that way. I want to experience him that way. So as we just take a moment here, would you just stand to your feet? And I want to pray for us. And if you would say, yes, I want, I want to experience Jesus this way, I just want us to pray and wait on him and believe. And I don't know what it looks like, you guys. <laughs> it can look like anything. It can, uh, an experience with God is not contained to a box. So what we're going to do is Rosemary's going to lead us in a song. She's going to sing. Um, and we're going to pray. And uh, let's just open ourselves up to God. I'm going to pray that he would encounter us. <clears throat> Father, we're here tonight. God, because you've ordained that we'd be in this place, you've drawn us to yourself. And God, just as Thomas, Lord, was one of your disciples, Lord, many of us are your disciples in this place. And we don't want to live our lives based on what we've heard about you. And we don't want to live our lives based on what our past experiences have been or what they haven't been. God, we want, we want to have an encounter with you. God, I believe that that is what it takes in order to create the belief that you're wanting to have in our lives is we have to have a personal encounter with Jesus. And not just one time 20 years ago, but God, today. God, tomorrow. God, to the next day, knowing, Lord, that we have experienced you. So God, I pray that you would show up in our lives. God, that you would remove every doubt, remove every fear, remove every bit of unbelief that we have and help us, that our, God, help us to live lives as believers. That truly is enough, God, that if we would be biblical believers, Lord, you said these signs shall follow them that believe. So, Lord, I just pray right now, God, that you would manifest yourself to us. If you agree with that, I want you to just mutter to the Lord and say, God, reveal yourself to me. God, reveal yourself to me.